Lord, we thank you today for your goodness and your kindness to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word and everything that you would have us receive today. We ask that you effectually work in our hearts and our minds. Help us to see something new for our life that would you know, bring us to a new understanding of what you have for us that is effectual for our lives. And that we would not allow any enemy of, the, of Satan to come against us and lie to us and cause us to fall into traps or to be consumed by things that are not of you, God. And Lord, we just ask that you bring your life to us today, that you bring your hope to us today, God. And we receive that with all of our hearts, Lord, that would be humbled in your presence, Almighty King, that we would be humbled to know your worth and your hope and the worth of those that you've put into our lives and that we would have appreciation for that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart. I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord have your way in me, every moment I'm awake, Lord have your way in me. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us, O oh God. We worship you today. We bring our offering of worship unto you, O oh God. We thank you, Lord. Today we are in Psalms 119 with the 14th letter, uh, Same. Uh, the, K, the K is silent, so Same. And we notice that the letter is made to where it's like someone is leaning over on a support and it means to lean upon uphold or support i hate those with divided loyalties but i love your instructions you are my refuge and my shield your word is my source of hope and we can just feel ourselves just lean over on his word on his hope and he shields us and he gives us refuge that he upholds us and supports us get out of my life you evil-minded people for i intend to obey the commands of my god lord sustain me as you promised that i may live do not let my hope be crushed sustain me and i will be rescued then i will meditate continually on your decrees but if you have rejected all who stray from your decrees, they are only fooling themselves. You skim off the wicked of the earth like scum. No wonder I love to obey your laws. I tremble in fear of you, and I stand in awe of your regulations. And as David wrote that, things were fresh for him in that knowledge of the word of God and what God was for him. There were things that we have been reading about the past couple of days and will today about disappointments that may have come. David disappointed in himself and his own failures, being allowing things to get in the way of his, you know, the plan that God had for him. And this happens to people. They are encouraged throughout parts of their life where they are serving God and they're doing what they should do. And they get into a place of discord in their own heart, disobedience, anything that can bring separation. And it causes a different mindset and they can fall away 
But when they have a firm foundation, there's always that knowledge of who God is. And he will continually, you'll see David, continually have a heart toward God. That's very important because a root of bitterness can grow so deep and it can separate us and it can bring us to a place of complete separation from God. Whether just in our mind or literal, it can bring such hard times to our lives. It's so important to cling to the old rugged cross, to cling to the word of God and to allow him to humble us. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is that King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of, of glory. O Lord, I give you my life. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love. For you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. Feel my pain and see my trouble. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me, rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you I take refuge. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you, O God. Ransom Israel from all its troubles. So we recall the state of David's house. Two sons dead, one through murder, his daughter raped. Another son runs away knowing that the judgment of the people would be that the king would put him to death for the murder of his brother, his uh, stepbrother. And the laws of the land at that time would give them every right to demand the death of Absalom, uh, that the king would issue that decree and have him put to death. David was in a dilemma. His family was being torn to pieces. Absalom was invited back, but he wasn't allowed to go into the presence of the king until two years, and finally there was a, some convincing to where David kissed him, but Absalom already had a root of bitterness that began. 
It says, after this, Absalom bought a chariot and horses, and he hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. He got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the people. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and they would tell him their tribe. Then Absalom would say, you've really got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were the judge, then everyone would bring their case to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. So Absalom is working up a scheme here. He's trying to win favor with people. He's putting David somewhat in a bad light when he says that too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it, questioning David's authority or his use of authority. Just with these little slight words, he doesn't say, oh, the king is bad, he's wrong, he, he messes up the kingdom. He comes in with these slight words. You sure have a strong case. So first he draws him in, makes him feel good, makes him feel like, wow, this is the king's son telling me this. And then he says, it's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it, but I would help you. So he's, he's stirring up something with the people. When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. So again, he's having that um, piety of, you know, he's knowing he has the position, but he's not forcing it on the people. He's standing back a little bit and seeing how they respond. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the kingdom for judgment. And so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. After four years, Absalom said to the king, let me go to Hebron to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill a vow I made to him. For while your servant was at Geshur in Aram, I promised to sacrifice to the Lord in Hebron if he would bring me back to Jerusalem. All right, the king told him, go and fulfill your vow. So Absalom went to Hebron. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. So he'd already won confidence. They're already looking at him like, wow, he's, he really cares about us. He really thinks we're special. We have a case. So he's already got this, you know, people looking at him with such admiration. So now he's in a position where he can stir up a rebellion. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say, Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. He took 200 men from Jerusalem with him as guests, but they knew nothing of his intentions. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, one of David's counselors who lived in Gilo. Soon, many others also joined Absalom and the conspiracy gained momentum. A messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David, all Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you. Then we must flee at once or it will be too late, David urged his men. Hurry, if we get out of the city before Absalom arrives, both we and the city of Jerusalem will be spared from disaster. We are with you, his advisors replied. Do what you think is best. So the king and all his household set out at once. He left no one behind except for 10 of the concubines to look after the palace. The king and all his people set out on foot, pausing at the last house to let all the king's men move past to lead the way. There were 600 men from Gath who had come with David along with the king's bodyguard. Then the king turned and said to Etah, a leader of the men from Gath, why are you coming with us? Go on back to King Absalom, for you are a guest in Israel, a foreigner in exile. You arrived only recently, and should I force you today to wander with us? I don't even know where we will go. Go on back and take your kinsmen with you and may the Lord show you his unfailing love and faithfulness. But Etah said to the king, I vow by the Lord and by your own life that I will go wherever my Lord the king goes, no matter what happens, whether it means life or death. David replied, all right, come with us. So Etah and his men and their families went along. Everyone cried loudly as the king and his followers passed by. They, they crossed the Kidron Valley and then went out toward the wilderness. Zadok and all the Levites also came along carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God and Abiathar 
offered sacrifices until everyone had passed out of the city. Then the king instructed Zadok to take the ark of God back into the city. If the Lord sees fit, David says, he will bring me back to see the ark and the tabernacle again. But if he is through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. The king also told Zadok the priest, look, here is my plan. You and Abiathar should return quietly to the city with your son Ahimaaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. I will stop at the shallows of the Jordan River and wait there for a report from you. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to the city and stayed there. David walked up the road to the Mount of Olives sweeping as he went. His head was covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning. The people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the hill. When someone told David that his advisor Ahithophel was now backing Absalom, David prayed, O Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. When David reached the summit of the Mount of Olives where people worshipped God, Hushai the archite was waiting there for him. Hushai had torn his clothing, put dirt on his head as a sign of mourning. But David told him, If you go with me, you will only be a burden. Return to Jerusalem and tell Absalom, I will now be your advisor, O king, just as I was your father's advisor in the past. Then you can frustrate and counter Ahithophel's advice. Zadok and Abiathar the priests will be there. Tell them about the plans being made in the king's palace. They will send their sons Ahimaaz and Jonathan to tell me what is going on. So David's friend Hushai returned to Jerusalem, getting there just as Absalom had arrived. So now unfolds this story with Absalom with this bitter root, with him stirring up a conspiracy against the king, his own son, his own father. The word of God says in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, there are six things that God hates. No, seven things he detests. The seventh one is what Absalom does, and Satan loves it. He uses it the most against families, against the people of God, people that are trying to have a right relationship. His lies are conniving in such a way that most sensible people will be swayed by these types of lies or division. That chapter 19, uh, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 19 says, A false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. That is the seventh thing that God detests. That takes information and turns it into a conspiracy against another family member. Sure, the family member may have made a mistake. They may have fallen away in some way, hurt somebody else in the family, committed adultery, was an addict. There's so many things, right? We know this about families. But God hates the people that go and spread the false witness and the lie because we are not that person. If yesterday I know that something happened and somebody made a mistake, and today I tell about it, I'm a liar. And why is that? Because we don't know that that person has not been on their knees that day. We don't know their place with God. We don't know that God has not forgiven them. Mercies are new every morning, every morning. It also says that God forgives and forgets. It's like putting that sin into the sea of forgetfulness. So we're pulling something up, some information up that may already be under the blood. And who are we to do that? God detests that. It, it sows discord in a family. We can call it the spirit of Absalom that can get on people. It happens with churches. It happens with families. It attacks believers. It's manipulative and deceptive. It's seen a lot of times in charismatic people because they are like a salesperson. They can really, like Absalom did at the beginning, where he was talking about 
Um, too bad the king doesn't have somebody to hear you. If it was me, I would... So he wasn't necessarily immediately bringing David to a bad state in their eyes, but he was sowing this web and building a relationship with people that would begin to trust in him so that he could come up against the king. It was all this conniving. Remember, Satan is here to kill, steal, and destroy. He does everything he can do to bring division in whatever way that he can. Undermining authority, if it's at a job, if it's at a church, if it's in a family, they start to bring up things that about the leader that brings doubt about the leader. And it's always, you know, with a good salesmanship type attitude. I want what's best for you. They're not doing right by you. Let's just, you know, we just need to pray for them and it's going to get better. I'm guilty of that. I am guilty of doing that. I ask God to forgive me that I would humble my heart and be honorable of all those. As David was with Saul, he never took the sword that he could have against Saul. He never dishonored the king and wouldn't let anybody else do it either. Even if we know that that authority is not really doing what they should do, our place is to honor, to pray for, and to allow God to bring the correction and trust in that. It breeds dissatisfaction and discontent. They capitalize on people's feelings about their, their parent or a leader or a boss. They, they start hearing maybe something that's, that somebody's not happy about and boy, they just start digging it up. And they'll say things like, I understand, I'm here for you. You know, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. All of that kind of talk. They promote illegitimate claims on the position. They'll try to usurp that throne or that authority and put themselves in the place of the anointing that may be on that person. They try to steal that anointing and make people point to them as the one that has that authority instead of honoring that leader and staying and allowing God to do the promoting. They harbor resentment and revenge. It can get, so this is what happened with Absalom. It just began building up and building up and building up until he was ready to take down the throne of his dad. Even, you know, having that kind of root of bitterness in him through what he had experienced, he if he would have gone before God and repented for God to heal his heart, he would receive supernatural healing that would turn around that. But it brings murderous thoughts. It brings disrespect. It, they go out on a tangent and they're ready to make it all right. But their efforts become futile and it usually falls to the ground. They want favor over others in the family and will tell lies to achieve this. Many of us have known that in companies we work for, in homes that we, families that we lived in, the family dynamic can create great bitterness and it can be created by a parent, it can be created by a grandparent, it can be created by all kinds of things where somebody stirs up lies. Absalom committed premeditated murder and David was that custodian of justice. The expectation of the people for David to incite judgment upon Absalom was so strong, but his love for his son was stronger and he protected him through all of it, even though it meant separation. And Absalom couldn't handle that part of it. He goes to get his own fame, his own position, he has good looks. He's, he's what everybody's wanting. He's becoming very popular. But ultimately, we will see as we continue and tomorrow that that destruction will come. And we just, you know, I pray today, Lord, help our hearts to be honorable. And, you know, I, I have grown up where I have to stick up for myself and prove something and and I you know I'm going to prove the point and I've been stubborn and I've been 
you know, unable to move and unable to see and unable to be respectful in my life. And I ask God, forgive me for that and help me to be honorable and to give honor where honor is due and to pray for those in leadership, to pray for our families, to pray for the elders of our family. And I honor my brother, Dan, and I welcome him continually. I tell him, Dan, talk, tell me what you want me to hear. I respect his authority in my life. I respect the authority of Stephen in my life. He's the next elder brother above me and my sister, Honey, and I respect their suggestions. I, I may not have always done that, but I confess that before you all that I want that corrected in my life and with my husband that he is the spiritual lead that God has given me for 44 years and I love him. And I want to have respect with him and honor what he asks. And, and I'm thankful that I ha God's given me a husband that wants to hear what I think. And we work together and it's a beautiful thing. But I just say today, God, that we humble ourselves before you, Lord, and that we give our hearts to you, that we look to you for all things, Lord, and we receive salvation for every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. God, we ask, Lord, that you touch every person of every language. You fill them with your spirit and they're baptized in your name and repentance, Lord, in this hour, in this time that we are so close to you calling your people home. Thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.